today. Everybody say hope. Finding hope in our uncertainties. See there? I'll just put that right there so you all know what I'm talking about today, okay? All right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure everybody sees that. All right, everybody, please take your seats. Let me give you a quick little feeling of the idea of uncertainties. Watch this. Could I get all of you on the west side to stand back up and all of you on the east side to stand back up? See, you, you thought you were going to be seated for like ever, right? Uncertainties. And you folks in the middle, look, you're still relaxed and already about to fall asleep on us, so just re- enjoy your, your little nap for a moment. There was a very important study done in Europe about uncertainties. And I just want to just use you two groups as an example for a minute. There was one group of 20 people, and I'm just going to say, you know, I know there's more than 20 on each side. There was another group of 20. They used two groups of 20 to, to, to do this test. They were figuring out how we handle uncertainties. How humans are responsive to uncertainties, not knowing for sure what's going to happen next. Well, they did this study, and it's a little bit uncouth, I suppose you could say. It's a little little harsh, a little cruel maybe. But they had one group of 20. Let's just say that's our west side group. You're the westerners over here, okay? You're the westerners. They gave them heads up. They were going to be getting 20 intense shocks in their bodies like that they were going to get 20 of them one right after the other so I'm going to ask the ushers to bring the wires right on in and start getting them connected to your temples (laughs) we have people moving to the center 20 sequential shocks intense shocks all right? And, and so this group, they knew what was coming. Now, then the other group of 20 people, they were going to get 20 shocks as well, but they were going to get them randomized. They were going to have 17 easy little shocks, and mixed in, they're going to have three real hard intensive zaps. They get the same number of zaps. They get the same number of intensive shocks. But the Easterners over here are going to have complete uncertainty as to when the next shock's coming that's going to jolt their body. Because they may go through two or three easy shocks or maybe four or five. Oh, 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 what's the next one going to be like? No one knows. It's called uncertainty. And then at some undefined random time, they get shocked intensely only three times. By the same, 20, the same shock that's given sustainably, consistently to the first group. So now you in the middle, let me just ask you in the middle, help me out. Everyone who thinks the stress was greater to the eastern side, would you please stand? And you are exactly right. That's what the science has found out. That not knowing introduces more stress than knowing that you're going to get shot. So you see the witness, east and west? If you knew you are going to get 20 intensive shocks, what you do, you just buckle down and you just say, okay, shock me. But if you don't know when it's coming to be a bad shock, then it is stressful. That's what I call uncertainty. And today, in the next few minutes, I want to offer you hope in the middle of uncertainties. I want to show you we can have hope when we don't even know how the next dice is going to fall on the table. I'm telling you, it doesn't seem, it seemed like dice to us, but can I tell you, when you're on track serving God, it's never random. God is always in control, and he always has a plan, and he's always going to bring you through those quote-unquote randomized shocks. Anybody been through a randomized shock in the last couple years? 
I mean, who in the world would have known we're going to get thrown at us COVID-19? Who would have known? I have a scripture for us to all read standing together, one scripture. It's Colossians 1.27. This is the core of the message today. If you get nothing else, Colossians 1.27 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, colon. Now, everybody, would you please read with me, which is Christ in you. I see why you're not speaking up. (laughs) Everybody say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everybody say it again. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of eternal life. That's what that means. The hope of a glorious, eternal relationship with God past this life and into the next Christ in you is your hope in uncertainties. Y'all ready to go have lunch? God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Well, that's the best preaching I've heard all week. Hey, folks, I've been out of church for like two weeks, so I've got a lot to talk about tonight, today. But I'm going to make it quick and easy, and I'm hoping and praying you'll follow and join right in. I have some reading for us to do because I want you to share with me a story out of the Bible, and we're going to read it together off the big screen. Can we make the screen work? Okay. All right, so just a minute. I'm going to turn our our attention to another scripture, and we're going to just, like, randomly, I'm going to have you stand and sit across. No, just kidding. We're not going to do that today. That would be a good case in point, though, wouldn't it? We're going to see what the Lord would have us to hear from him about hope. Hope. Everybody say hope. hope. Hope has a lot of synonyms. What's another word for hope? Shout it out. Hope. What else? Hope. Oh, there you go. Expectation. That's right. Hey, that that comes from an expecting father. Congratulations to Bobby and Layla. (laughs) Brother Bobby's like, man, I didn't mean for that to happen. But anyway, yes expectation. All right, do we have another couple of expecting parents in the house that would like to shout out an, a word, a synonym for <laughs> confidence? Thank you, Don. All right, I'm waiting for one other couple. I'm waiting quietly to see if they'll, they'll shout out a synonym for hope. No. Wish. There it is. <laughs> Did y'all hear who that was? Stephen and Jenny Hubble are expecting a baby boy. Congratulations to you guys. Wow, what a perfect way to announce expectation. We're going to have a massive revival in this church if it comes by birth. We got a lot of babies coming. And can I tell you, a lot of them are boys. And I am just excited about the next five years. It's going to be amazing, isn't it? If the Lord tarries. Expectation. How about this? Anticipation. No one said that that I heard. Did you say anticipation? Anticipation, hope. How about supposing? We don't really think of it, but I suppose when I go out to my car, it's going to be there. (laughs) You know, I hope. How many of you hope your car's out there? (laughs) See? (laughs) Hope. But real hope, the only hope that really makes a difference is hope that you have inside out. Not hope that you're given from a politician. Not hope that you're given from a lottery victory. Not hope that you're given from a doctor. But the hope that you're given Christ in you. The hope of glory. Let's bow together. Lord, you are desperately needed in this house. Lord, you, without you, in fact, we might as well give up. Without you, Lord, this is nothing but a club, a society, a gathering. And, Lord, we can do that all day long, other places, without calling you. But, Lord, I appeal to the heavens right now and pray that you would let your power, 
Let your anointing, Lord, and let your victory and your hope be alive in every heart here today. Lord, I pray that there would be a birthing of hope in our hearts today in the middle of uncertainties. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. You are welcome to take your seats. Christmas is almost here. We are in the beginning of what we call the Advent season. Advent means coming. Advent means the arrival of something. And Jesus Christ arrived right around 0 B.C., A.D., and he split time in two. If people don't even believe in God, they're already acknowledging to some degree that he made a difference in history when they say what year it is. 2021 is not a randomized time that somebody just conjured up in some community or committee. No. Zero was the end of the old, and literally you can, you can count on the New Testament initiation at the zero year A.D. Because zero to 30, roughly 30 in history, Gregorian calendar, it's the life of Jesus Christ. And so today, Jesus is alive. He hasn't disappeared. He hasn't departed. He is here. He's in this house. He loves you. And you know what Jesus wants you to do? He wants you to be filled with hope before you leave here today. That means filled with him before you leave here today. Filled with hope in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He does not want us to leave here empty. He wants to leave us, he wants us to leave here full of hope in our uncertainties because we are definitely living in uncertainties. Luke's Christmas narrative, the Bible gives us many books. One of those 66 books is the book of Luke. The book of Luke has the main Christmas story contained in those first few chapters. You read it probably many of times. Regardless, the Christmas story really kind of comes to an end after Jesus is born, the shepherds leave, and then it seems like the Christmas story is over. But here's what I want us to do. I want us to take a look a little more closely at the next scene. Specifically, the characters in this scene are Simeon and Anna. Here it is. Let's read it together. Could I get you to muster a little vocal strength with me? And let's read Luke 2.22. And we're going to read right on down to the latter part of the 30s. Luke 2.22. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed. Thank you for reading along with me. They brought him to Jerusalem. You know who him is? Capital H. They brought him to Jesus. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As was written in the law of the Lord, they were being obedient to the law. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. You guys are almost like, well, I, now, I know where, now I know where 12 days of Christmas comes from. No, not really. Turtle doves. All right, behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. There he is. Here was our character. You ready? This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. <sighs> My goodness. His waiting was fueled by his faith in God. And his faith was fueled by his hope in the Old Testament promise. Did y'all hear what I just said? He was waiting for the consolation. What does consolation mean? It means Israel to be brought back on the map and put back into good graces with God because they'd stepped so far away from God. They had 400 years of silence, nothing from God. But they had Malachi, and they had the books before Malachi. They had the promises. Just you wait, friends. Just you have faith, friends, and have hope, friends, because the consolation is coming. Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Let's read it. And it had been revealed 
to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, so he took him up in his arms. That means he was small enough to be held. He picked up Jesus, picked him up, and he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. 400 years of nothing, 400 years of death silence and the heavens are brass and nothing is going on, but I've got the Spirit upon me and the Lord has made a promise to me in the holy word of my spirit. I hear it and look, here he is. My eyes have seen your salvation which you've prepared for the face of all people. Uh, a light, a light to bring revelation to the, gospel, to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Here he is right here in my arms. His mom and dad, Joseph, and his mother, man, they're like, what in the world is this guy doing with our baby? They marveled at those things which were spoken of their baby. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, behold, mother, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against Yes, a sword will pierce through Mary, your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There's Simeon. Everybody say, thank you, Simeon. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for your faith, which fueled your waiting. And thank you for your hope that fueled your faith. See, if we can have hope today, we'll have faith. And if we have faith, you know what? We can hang out. And wait for God's plan to unfold. Not a minute before, not a minute late, but waiting. Can I just make sure y'all are catching that? Waiting is fueled by faith. Faith is fueled by hope. Now, next, next character, Anna. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age. Everybody who's of great age in here say amen. amen. That really means old. And I think every age is great, honest with you, but anyway. Now, she lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Now, let's read together. This woman was a widow of about, I'm waiting for you to help me, about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in, at that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Yet another character, knowing it's worth the wait. Knowing it's worth being patient. Knowing I don't have to have this today, I've got a promise. Knowing I'm not going to break the bank today because God Almighty has not done what he told me he was going to do today, I'm going to wait. I'm going to have patience. <laughs> Excuse me. Can I tell you, patience is fueled. Patience is fueled by faith. Faith is fueled by hope. Amen. So some of you came here today with real, without realizing it. You came with a hope that today's preaching would only be like 10 minutes. Some of you came with this hope that an expectation, supposing that maybe it would be, you know, 30 minutes maybe. But I know there might even be a few here today that would love to hear preaching for an hour. But that's not everybody. So I'm not going to cater to them. But I'm going to tell you what I am going to do. I'm going to preach till the preacher's done, the Holy Spirit, capital P, preacher. And I just want to tell you right here that Almighty God, by his power, I believe is helping us to understand some very important things uncertainty is a real deal. It is a certain thing that we have a lot of uncertainty in our world. 
you know what, can I just tell you that I don't believe, and this is what researchers and doctors are saying when they study all these things. I'm not going to get into the statistics, but here's, what, here's what's being spoken. Americans are smiling less and worrying more than they were a year ago, people say. The happiness quotient of people's hearts and minds is down and sadness is up. We're getting less sleep, smoking more cigarettes, the depression is on the rise. Now, these doctors tell me, and I'm reading to you from a very reputable source, that the real problem is not because your piggy bank is empty. The real problem is not financial. The real problem is uncertainty. There are so many people in our world today that just don't know what's going to happen, and they have never felt that way until the COVID. <laughs> Will I have a job next week? Will I be able to afford a head of lettuce next week? How am I going to buy toys, and how am I going to, am I going to have a place to live. What's ahead? I don't know. Crystal balls would really sell like hotcakes, wouldn't they, if they worked. People would love to know what's coming and have a 100% certainty to know when they're going to get that next shock. That's the problem when we don't know. There is an uncertainty that causes discomfort. And that uncertainty causes us with unhappiness. And that unhappiness spills over into the national gloom that isn't a matter of insufficient funds. It's a matter of insufficient certainty. What we need today is something that will help us in the midst of our uncertainty. I wish I could help you today and hand out certainty to this crowd. But I can't hand out certainty to this crowd. But I can tell you there is a place where you can find hope. Let me show you what Psalm 42 says. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Listen to this. Why are you so su su suffering and dissatisfied? Why are you so depressed? I love this scripture. You might want to mark this if you're suffering with, de with depression. Because this right here is an extremely powerful scripture. It says, why are you having such a depressed day? Why are you disquieted? Why are you just churning within me? Why, are there, why is there no peace on the inside? Well, the psalmist tells himself, here is the answer, hope in God. <laughs> hope in God. <laughs> and he says, for, yet, for I shall yet praise him and help the help of my countenance and my God. I will yet praise him, the help of my... Look at your neighbor and say, you could use some help with your countenance. Just kidding. You might not want to do that. <laughs> help of my countenance. He's the help of my countenance. Why are you so happy all the time? Randy Chalinski, praise God. You're here at your church on Sunday morning for the first time in months. You're smiling. You got countenance help today. I could, I could just share, I could, I could chat with you guys forever about everybody here. But Brother Randy just wrote a very eloquent and professional letter to his boss and said, I'm sick of missing church on Sundays. Would you please let me go to church? And he finally said yes, like yesterday or the day before. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, brother. Help my countenance. How many of you have a wife that you wish the Lord would help their countenance? Husbands. Oh, how many of you wives are like, God, please help my husband with his countenance? Can I tell you, when you really get this that I'm preaching about today, you're going to have countenance helped very much. And you'll be able to put a smile on your face in the middle of depression and despair and say, God is my hope. Can somebody say it right now? God, you are my hope. We're, you are my hope today. You are my hope today. Praise God. We have lived through moments that are big in our lives in the last couple of years. We've, we've lived through things that, that changed our course of expectation. 
we've, we've lived through things that are massive. I'm telling you, I mean, how many of you remember where you were when, uh, and probably some of us aren't old enough, but you remember where you were on 9-11? How about I go a little further back? Anybody know, remember where you were when Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot? How about when JFK was shot? Now, that's going way back. But how many of you remember where you were when you realized coronavirus is for real? <laughs> I, I was in denial for a long time. I remember. It's just something in China that's going to go away. We happen to be getting some random headlines over here in the, in the, in the United States. But we've been through big moments. Our lives are never the same through these moments. And unfortunately, so many of these tend to be negative events, catastrophes, tragedies. They strike with no warning. They introduce a new sense of uncertainty in our lives, like the shock that I'm talking about earlier in this message today. But can I just bring this message in for a landing by telling you these words? Simeon and Anna in your Bible were people who knew how to keep hope alive in the middle of uncertainties. We think we've had a bad day. Can I tell you, you think you've had a bad year? But have, I just want you to realize you have no idea. So did Israel back in the days of the Bible. It had been generations and generations since the formation of God's covenant with humanity and, and the promise of a Messiah. It had been hundreds of years. People had forgotten about it. People had scoffed at it. People thought it was not going to happen anymore. People gave up hope and just went about living their lives the best they knew how to live their lives. And many, many went on just to think, you know what, I guess we'll just build the best that we can of what we've got. But there were a few who said, you know what, I think I know. God made promises to bless us. He made promises to restore humans in this messed up world. God is a God of a perfect creation. We're not satisfied to live in this imperfect creation without knowing that there is reason for hope. So can I just tell y'all that the fulfillment of the covenant, the fulfillment of the consolation we just read, the fulfillment of Jesus coming as a Messiah on Christ, <clears throat> that first Christmas, he would come to make everything right. And, and so... The Israelites who were somewhat aware of this, it was not just a happy idea that drifted in and out of their consciousness. It is their deepest hope, their deepest prayer, and their sustained, something that sustained them and encouraged them and spurred them on, especially through thousands of years of uncertainty. Can you imagine living through so much uncertainty? There were those who clung to God's promise to Abraham when he said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Sure didn't feel like it. With a regime like the Roman Empire having their thumb on us, keeping us from really having preeminence and liberties, and we need Messiah. <laughs> How long, oh God? That was one of the cries of the ancient Israelites. How long? How long can hope survive? How long can we keep this expectation? There's world-changing forces that went and took their way, had their way through Jerusalem and the Israelites' experience. They knew they were God's chosen people. They knew that there was something that God was doing. And I, I want to thank God for the Bible that tells us, especially in the book of Daniel, that there were going to be world-changing forces that are going to come over God's people, the Israelites. The Greek empire is going to have sway for a while. Then they're going to be brought down because the Babylonians brought the Greeks down. And then there's going to come a moment when the Greeks, Greeks are going to go down and then the Roman empire will stand strong. Those cultures still influence our world today. But I wonder if you were in zero B.C., how could you have an ember of hope left smoldering? How could you? Because this is just not happening. My parents never saw anything. My grandparents 
my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents, there's been nothing. But can I just tell you, the scriptures we just read answer that question. Embers of hope can remain smoldering and ready for someone to fan the flames and say, yes, the promise is real. Simeon and Anna were sparks of hope in Israel. More than that, they were torches of hope expecting God to come through. Everybody say, God, come through. How many of you need the Lord to come through? They expected the Lord to come through and, and do what he promised. I believe Simeon and Anna, we don't usually focus on them like I am today, but I'm thankful that we have these elderly people in the temple who encountered the very first encounters publicly with the little baby Jesus. And they said, this is what we have been waiting for all along. <laughs> Woo! You got to think about this. These, these two weren't young people. They were elderly. They both lived long lives. They've seen and experienced many things, a lot of hardship, a lot of pain. Anna had been a widow for decades, a position of low social status in that culture. Trust me. Simeon and Anna have remained faithfully devoted to God. And here's the bottom line. They remain ready. Lord, please don't ever catch me not ready. Ready to see God act. Ready to see God do great things. Ready to see God transform my life and transform my world. Put the broken things back together. Put a smile back on the faces of those who are frowning. Bring relationships back together that were long thought impossible to be ever repaired. Did you notice in Luke's account that neither Simeon or Anna seemed the least bit surprised or uncertain about the fact that this baby, Jesus, is the long-promised Messiah? Think about that. Almost everyone else in the Christmas story so far has taken a little bit of convincing that this is real. Think about it. Simeon and Anna were ready. They didn't need angels coming from heaven singing and saying glory to God in the highest and freaking them out, right? They were ready. Everybody say they were ready. I believe I could see Anna and Simeon tuned in, waiting, watching, listening, expecting, filled with hope, the hope that made them ready. Day after day, year after year, Simeon and Anna had served God faithfully, inspired and fueled by this faith and hope that God was at work, even though they couldn't see it. Even if they were surrounded by hardship, even as time passed, they grew older and they grew older. you got to think about it. The year before and the year before this, they're just aging away. Simeon and Anna are getting older and wondering, will this ever happen? But can I tell you, they still held on to hope. They fostered new and renewed their hope on a regular basis as they set their focus on God, worshiping him regularly, serving him regularly, serving others regularly. Just taking one step faithfully at a time as they waited. And if you could just interview them today, I have a feeling they would say, of course God came through. This is what he said he would do. The Messiah's here. They rejoiced and they celebrated and you know what they did? They infused new hope into the people around them, including Mary and Joseph themselves, who were still figuring out what's going on. What does it mean to be earthly parents of a heavenly Messiah? So Simeon and Anna, they reveal several things about hope. Can I just give you a quick little list here? Number one, they show us that hope sees beyond. Hope sees beyond beyond. Hope knows there is more. Hope knows that there is something that exists before the reality actually happens. I mean, you can right now, all of you can sit there and hope that, you can even hope with all your heart that I have a hundred dollar bill here in my pocket and I'm going to take it out and give it to you right here on the spot. Right? You can hope that. 
you could, you could sit here and hope that, of course. But what, what is it? Hope precedes the reality. Hope by its nature exists in the uncertainty before. It exists in questions. Hope exists in doubts even. Think about that. Hope in that unclear sense of what is to come. But hope is the willingness and desire to believe what our own present circumstances and reality are presenting to us. God is with us. That's number two. Number one, sees beyond. Number two, God is with us here, now, and always. Coronavirus or not, God is with us here, now, and always. Here, now, and always. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you. God says, I have plans to give you hope and a future. Hope and a future. Do not fear, I've redeemed you, he says. When you pass through the waters, it will not be, you will not be set ablaze. When you walk through the fire, you're not going to be burned. When you have to pass through the rivers, they're not going to sweep over you. That's hope. That's hope that says, you know what? He's with me now. Even if I don't see it, even if I can't understand it, even the promise is somewhere out there in the future. Hope. Can I tell you, number three, hope inspires us to carry on. Lord, I'm going to keep on moving. I'm going to keep on trusting. I'm not giving up. Today's not my last day. I'm going to keep on traveling. I'm going to keep on trusting. I'm going to keep staying faithful. In Jesus' name, can I tell you, the scripture tells us, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Anybody here today want to boast in the hope of the glory of God? We know. We know suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Hope doesn't put us to shame. Now, that right there is a snagging spot for this message that I could take a whole long time on. But I want to tell you that one little phrase, hope does not put us to shame, is very important because the hope I'm talking about, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is not a hope that will ever make you ashamed. Now, what, what am I talking about? Imagine your life being a ladder. Okay, you got a ladder. You're young. Okay, what building am I going to put this, build, this ladder on? What am I going to live my life for? And you carry that ladder around and you're like, whoa, whoa, okay. Whoa, where am I going to put this ladder? And you find a building and you, boom, you put it up against the building. Can I imagine with you, your life being a ladder? And you start climbing a rung at a time. You're leaning it against a building of your highest hopes. Can you imagine you climb all your life in hope? One rung after the other. One step after another. A little higher every day. Now imagine this. You get to the top of your ladder and you realize you've been leaning against the wrong building all the time. That is hope that is shameful. It's embarrassing. Oh my goodness, I spent my whole life on this. That is hope that disappoints, friends. That is hope that brings to shame. How many of you have ever been sitting on a bank of a river or in a boat somewhere and you're, you got your line in the water and you're fishing, right? And you're like, finally, oh, finally I caught a big one. Woo! And you reel and you reel in hope, right? You caught a big one. I'm so excited. You stand up. Everybody's like, wow, somebody finally caught one. And you're like, yep, I got hope now. Here I am. I'm reeling in and I'm reeling in. I'm excited. There is anticipation. This is called fishing hope right here. I can't wait. Here it comes after dragging and reeling and hoping. Isn't it aggravating and embarrassing when all you get is the broken, sopping wet branch of a tree underwater that you pull to the surface? I mean, everybody's taking pictures. <laughs> he caught, she caught one. Here it is. It's all mossy, slimy branch. That's hope that disappoints. That's hope that makes us ashamed. But here, as I wrap this message up today, I've got to tell you, that's not the kind of hope we're talking about. We're talking about hope that says, okay, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm leaning against the right building. <laughs> I want to run a little underwater camera and make sure this is really a, a big fish, right? You can do that when you have biblical vision. 
when you have spiritual vision and you have a hunger for the things of God. There's somebody here today who's about to walk out of this sanctuary back to your car with hope, with hope. Because now you realize hope cannot be given to you by a pastor or a pulpit or a rabbi or a priest. Hope comes from Jesus Christ. Hope in you. Hope is Christ in you. Hope is the Holy Ghost. Hope is the Spirit of God. Hope does not come from a teacher. Hope does not come from a parent. Hope does not come from an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent. Hope doesn't come from this world. Hope comes from the Holy Spirit inside. If you have the Holy Ghost today, you have hope. And I tell you, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can have hope today. In Jesus' name, I, I pray that somebody here today would realize, God, I got I to gotta get to you. I got I to gotta move my ladder. Lord, I got to put it against the right place. I want to be, be working on something that's worthwhile. I want to be climbing the way I need to be climbing until I reach the heavens. God, I don't want to miss out. I don't want my life to be wasted on shameful hope. So as we stand together, I want you to know here today, I've got one more verse. I want, I, I'm actually gonna just, just going to do a repeat as we pray. In the Middle Ages, friends, in the Middle Ages, the sea route to India seemed impossible. Often it was discussed in the great economic and political centers of Europe, if we could only get to India, if we could only make it there because there is great prosperity, there is a future, there is something worth having. And they used to wonder whether there would be a route around the bottom tip of Africa to that rich land of spices in India. Ooh, people slept, they dreamed, they hoped, and they wondered if they could do it. And so many tried. They launched their fleet of ships, and they began that trip thinking, if only I can get past the bottom tip of Africa. But so many tried and so many failed because they would always encounter de debilitating storms. And so that became known as the Cape of Storms. It was an impossibility to pass it. No more hope. There's no reason to go on past that hope. That hope is over with. There's, we wanted to do it. We really hoped we could go around the tip of Africa and get on up to India. But it's an impossibility. Some people threw their hands up and said, no way. It just can't be done. But there was an explorer named Vasco da Gama. Maybe you remember from history, he decided, I'm going to try again. He went down to the hope, the Cape of Storms. <laughs> and lo and behold, with his proper preparation, he succeeded. And he was ever since then, he was one who was known as the individual who could do what was doubted strongly by all of the known world. When he returned to Lisbon, it could never be doubted again. It can be done. We can make it around that cape of storms. He proved that to use that treacherous way wasn't inevitably disastrous. And the cape of storms became known as the cape of good hope. And today, how many of you are standing with the Europeans saying, I just don't see why I need to pray because I always go and it's just storms and it's just hard and God just doesn't answer me. God seems to not hear me. I wonder if there's a Vasco de Cama in the Holy Spirit today who will say, you know what? God is opening my eyes to a new hope. I can do this. I'm ready to press a little further than ever before. Friends, my invitation to you today is to take a step towards good hope. And let's, in this season of Christmas, remember that hope is dawning again for those who turn their hearts and their lives toward Jesus. I'm glad to tell you Jesus is coming. Jesus is returning again. Jesus is in this house. Uh, could I invite everybody in this place to begin to welcome him with our hearts? and welcome him into our lives. 
How about today we make this decision? Lord, we want to be sure that we receive the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory.